Hello folks, this is uh, Dr. Shingima Vima. And uh, as part of this series where we are talking about African history and different African phenomena, I thought it would be great for us to start with a refresher on an approach that I like to take to the study of African phenomena, African phenomena and African uh, diasporic phenomena. And that is the, uh, an African-centered approach. Um, you know, or also defined as an Afrocentric approach. And there may be some nuances to those differences, uh, but for the purposes of this, of this, uh, of this discussion, uh, we'll keep it very simple. Uh, so we'll talk about why, we'll talk about what it is and why it is necessary to adopt as we, as we discuss African phenomena. So thank you for joining me. Uh, let's get started. Okay, let me share the screen. Okay, perfect. So, oh, all right. So this is where we act. So like I said, it's the African-centered idea, African-centered uh, worldview, uh, which uh, has also been defined as, which has also been termed Afrocentricity. So we're talking about the importance of it, right? And we'll talk about where some of these words come from as we proceed. Um, so what is it? So there are several scholars who have defined this, but uh, possibly the most prominent scholar who has written about this uh, in books such as the Afrocentric Idea and others is uh, Dr. Molefi Asante, uh, currently of, uh, of Temple University, I believe, who defines it as placing African ideals at the center of any analysis that involves African culture and behavior. So placing African ideals at the center of any analysis that involves African culture and behavior. And we'll unpack that as we go. Um, another prominent scholar is uh, C.T. Keto, uh, who, uh, whose book, Vision and Time, is one of my favorites as far as talking about the, the African-centered worldview. And it describes an African-centered paradigm as providing a framework for the centering of knowledge about Africans at home and abroad on the experience of Africans as subjects of history, as subjects of history, which when we say as subjects of history, what are we, why, why is the emphasis on that? Well, it is, it is an opposition to the notion of Africans as objects of history to where history happens to Africans. Africans themselves do not have any agency in their history, but they are, they are objects. So they are not subjects, which if you know, uh, if you know uh, grammar, right? We have a subject, then we have a verb, then we have an object. I drank the water. I am the subject. Drank is the verb. Water is the, sub, is the object. So what we're trying to do is to move us from being the object of history. The Africans were colonized right? Uh, the Europeans colonized the Africans. This was discovered and, you know, all these things, right? And we are trying to move ourselves away from being the objects of history to being the subjects. So you may be wondering, why is this even necessary? How prevalent is this? A lot of you would have noticed already that this is a trend in how people articulate the welfare of Africans. Um, some of you it's been so normalized that you don't notice how prevalent it is. So let's look at some instances. Um, of, of why this matters, why, why we would even bother with this, right? So here are a few quotes that I've drawn from prominent uh, figures, thinkers, uh, uh, leaders, and, and the likes uh, in history, and how they've articulated the place of the African and the African descendant uh, in the world. Uh, George Hegel, George Hegel, a uh, famous, uh, German philosopher, and we'll talk more about his significance in a little bit. But he says, the Negro exhibits the natural man in his completely wild and untamed state. For Africa is no historical part of the world. It has no movement or development to exhibit. Wow. Very degrading, very... Uh, it wasn't even as controversial a statement back when he said it, but it is, it is very, really posits Africans as subhuman, as primitive, as 
primitive in the very real sense of the word that they are within the realm of primates, right? The natural man in this completely wild and untamed space. Africa is no historical part of the world. It has no movement or development to exhibit. That is insane, of course, if you are, if you know about African history, uh, it's, it's such an absurd statement, right? We can talk about, you know, movement right from the beginning. We can talk about movement throughout the, the, the millennia. Um, uh, and these are some of the things that we'll talk about in this series. But of course, if you know, we can talk about everything. We can talk about uh, the universities of Northern Africa. We can talk about uh, the empires of, of Western Africa. We can talk about uh, the Nguni migrations and, and the very nuanced ways in which our societies developed, right? Um, and, and a lot of things we can, we can be here all day on that, but I don't wanna, but why is this important? Well, George Hegel, for studies of, for scholars of philosophy, you will know George Hegel, right? George Hegel, we talk about the Hegelian dialectic. We talk about this Hegelian way of thinking. We even talk about in, in, in art history, we talk about the idea of aesthetics, which are the, the notions of aesthetics that are often uh, referred to are Hegel's ideas on aesthetics. What does that mean? Well, Hegel, in many uh, realms of scholarship, is the person who defines aesthetics. And that means he defines, from a scholarly point of view, what constitutes beautiful. I want you to remember that. He defines what constitutes beautiful. And if this man who dis decides what constitutes beautiful has this view of Negroes, right, of Africa as a continent and its descendants, what does that mean for, for, for Africa and beauty? According to him, according to this revered philosopher scholar, Africa and beauty are incompatible, right? That's how that follows. But maybe that's back in the day. Let's look at something more recent. This is the 1960s. I am apt to suspect the... No, sorry, this is not in the 60s. This is prior as well. Um, I am apt to suspect the Negroes to be naturally inferior to whites. So it's the same sentiment, right? That a lot of people believe that black inferiority is something that is inherent. Okay, so again, this is a very Eurocentric approach and something that serves... Um, an imperial, an imperial uh, purpose, okay? So it's an imperial purpose. So, and again, this whole series will ultimately debunk that. So I just want you to, these are prominent thinkers we are talking about, scholars and thinkers. These are the things that they've said. What else has been said? Over here, Thomas Jefferson, uh, one of the old time great leaders of the greatest nation in the world, right? One of the, one of the founding fathers. And he goes, free blacks were pests in society as incapable as children of taking care of themselves. And he has never seen an elementary trait of painting or sculpture or poetry among blacks and has argued that blacks ability to reason was much inferior to whites while in imagination they are dull, tasteless and anomalous. So Thomas Jefferson, Right now, in recent times, his uh, you know his uh, slave ownership, his uh, rape of his mistress, and and these things have been brought to the to the to the front lines. But we cannot pretend that his ideas are still not foundational to to the U.S. and by extension Western society, right? Um, and by extension, with given the influence that Western society has had on the rest of the world. Uh, you know, they're influential to the rest of the world. But this is this impression of, of Black people. By the way, you ask yourself how Thomas Jefferson has, had, has interacted with, with, with Black people. How did he interact with them? As enslaved people, right? So not only do you, do, were these people uh, kidnapped uh, from, from their homelands, they've been dispossessed of everything, culture, language, agency, any form of agency, only for you to turn around and say that they are pests on society, right? And what is crazy about this in particular for me is even in, most ra in, in, in several racist minds, 
they at least concede that Africans and, uh, and people of African descent are, are artistic, you know? So the fact that this particular quote will even deny them of imagination of uh, an elementary trait of painting or sculpture, it is insane, you know? I mean, all of it is insane, but really? You, you're not even gonna give us, uh, uh, you know, imagination? That is, the, you know, it's ridiculous. Now, this is the one I was talking about from the 1960s, one prominent historian, Trevor Roper, who said, perhaps in the future, there will be some African history to teach. But at present, there is none. There is only the history of Europeans in Africa. Wow. So, again, absurd, right? This is 1963, 1964. Um, the only way I can account for this if he had meant uh, written, whether African history had been written, and to which that would have been true, and that is the problem we are we are remedying by 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 in our scholarship and by speaking up of this. I'm apt to believe that he didn't mean it that way. I'm apt to to believe that it was from a point of view of developments of African contributions to human civilization, and then if that's the case. That is ridiculous. And again, these are the things that we're here to, to push back against. We'll look at one more, I believe. Uh, let's go. Okay, cool. So this one comes out of 1980 uh, from P. Botha, P. W. Botha, who I believe was the second from last president in apartheid South Africa, or second from last prime minister in apartheid South Africa before the clerk came in. And uh, he had made this comments that, talking about black people, right? They are good at nothing else but making noise, dancing, marrying many wives, and indulging in sex. Let us all accept that the black man is a symbol of poverty, mental inferiority, laziness, and emotional incompetence. It isn't, isn't it plausible, therefore, that the white man is created to rule the black man? And this is uh, part of the justification of apartheid. And if you read this whole speech, it's very upsetting, as it is stupid. Uh, there was a part when he was talking about how, even though black people and white people are, look the same, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are the same, because lizards look like alligators or crocodiles, and they are not the same animal which is, again, is ridiculous from a biological standpoint because those are actually very distinct species, which are black people and white people are not. But again, this, th these aren't just racist views espoused by a random person. Everybody that I've been talking about right now shapes the world, right? You know, these are presidents and, and prime ministers and scholars and philosophers. So this is what we are up against. This is what we are dismantling here, right? Um, and you can just pick it apart. It's all, it's all, it's all ridiculous, right? Uh, it's a symbol of poverty. Yeah, they're, they're poor when you have deprived them of, of, of resources and access to their resources for hundreds of years, right? Laziness, how dare you, you know? <laughs> you enslave people, you know, these people have been enslaved. They work even in, in apartheid South Africa where, where uh, uh, the black community were the, were the beasts of burden, quote unquote, right? They worked in the mines. They worked as, as domestic servants. They, they worked in the farms. Only for you to turn around and, and, and critique uh, them for being lazy, it's, 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 it's as uh, asinine as it is oxymoronic, right? Uh, so these are the ideas. Then also, you know, they're good at nothing but making noise, dancing, all these things which are really yeah, dancing is awesome. So I don't know what you're talking about. But in any case, let's keep it moving. Uh, now, this is from, um, from the 2000s. Um, and it comes out of the uh, autobiography of Zimbabwean cricketer Henry Olonga, where he describes at some point how there was a, there had been allegations of racist in the, in the Zimbabwean cricket national team, right, in, 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 uh, allegations of racism. Um, and if you know about, about uh, cricket as a sport, um, it is something that comes out of the British Empire. So now it's starting to change with other countries starting to play as well. But mainly it's been countries of the British Empire or historically of the British Empire that play 
uh, cricket. Very few countries that thrive in it. So uh, this is uh, uh, England and 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 uh, and the other British countries, uh, Scotland, Wales, and whatnot. Um, Australia, New Zealand, right? So the empire, if you will. Then uh, after a while, it spread to uh, to India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka. These are also some good countries, but also still part of the uh, of the Commonwealth, if you will. The West Indies uh, as well uh, play as a unit. Then in Africa, it's mainly been Zimbabwe and South Africa for a long time, uh, with Kenya and Namibia also dabbling. So just to give you that. But those countries that I spoke about in Africa that were predecessors of it are what we call settler colonies. So they are not administrative colonies like, uh, uh, say, Ghana and Nigeria, for example, which I'm sure by now are also actively involved in cricket. But historically, it's been the settler colonies. It's been the countries where uh, British people came and settled and, and, and got going playing cricket. So really... Up until recent times in both South Africa and Zimbabwe, uh, I haven't really kept up with South Africa like that in recent times, but the teams have still been predominantly um, white uh, people, even in, in, in a post-apartheid, post-colonial, you know, and that's just because those were the folks who were exposed to it. But in 2000, there's a shift and some, uh, a lot of black Zimbabweans are starting to play and, and breaking into the team as well. And when these allegations were, were had, uh, um, consultants came in and delivered this this survey and one of the responses that came up was black people will never be good at batting because they are psychologically incapable of timing the batting stroke right if you know cricket and if you don't know cricket and you know baseball is you know just imagine it being the same concept right that you know they are not uh, psychologically incapable of, of batting uh, of timing the batting stroke, although they may be good bowlers, what in baseball would be similar to pitching. So think about that statement. Uh, this is in the 2000s, right? By then, we've already seen the experts of the likes of Brian Lara, who was one of the greatest uh, batters of all time out of the West Indies, black man. Since then, we've seen the likes of, uh, of, of, of uh, Gale, Chris Gale, also of, the New, of New Zealand. We've seen, if you wanna talk about whiteness as opposed to blackness, we can talk about Sachin Tendulkar, who's Indian, but again, and I, I, it really hurts my heart to, to, uh, to go overboard in, in speaking about the racial politics of a sport that, is, that I rather enjoy. But this is what we are talking about here. These are the, the, the things we are talking about. Um, Right? But this is in 2000. And actually, it's interesting, uh, as I'm doing this right now, I'm doing this in, in June 2020, just two weeks ago, I interviewed a, a, a guy, Kevin Kasuza, who plays for the Zimbabwe national cricket team uh, from my old neighborhood back in Mutare, Zimbabwe. And he's the, now the opening batsman uh, for the Zimbabwean team. And he, on his debut uh, test against Sri Lanka, he scored two... Uh, what we call tons or centuries. Um, that's a hundred runs. Pretty much it's a big deal when you do that in, in cricket. So, you know, it's such an absurd way of thinking. But think about the person who was saying this was either a teammate to black people and you're saying this, or was a coach to, to black people, or somebody involved with this, and they still held these views, even though, uh, you know, they're, they're outrageous, right? So these are the reasons why this matters. Why does this matter? It matters because for a long time, in the age of imperialism, of Western imperialism, slavery, colonialism, the status quo has been a Eurocentric status quo. So it's the way the European and European descendant people, which means by extension the Western world, as the normal and everything that is not like them is inferior, right? It is inferior, and that argument is used as a way to justify things like subjugation, colonialism, uh, slavery, and these things. And it, it, it has been manifest in, in academia as well, because as you will see, you will see why that is important, uh, how they've been able to do that. And some thinkers have spent some time thinking about this. So, okay. 
So now you see contemporary erasure. Now I put this together. I forgot to give this a shout out in the beginning. Uh, this presentation or a version of it was originally cr created uh, for the My Brothers and Sisters uh, Keeper uh, Mentoring Organization out of Detroit. And I created it with my, with my, with my brother and good friend, Michael, uh, Michael Wilson. Uh, but it's since been updated several times since then. But in any case, um, so this is from a few years ago. And you look at the subtle erasures, subtle erasures, right? So over here, we have this uh, grade school textbook that talks about from pharaoh to laborer, right? And think about the implication of that, from pharaoh to laborer. And the pharaoh uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a is a is a is a young white boy. Uh, so is the queen. By the time we get to the laborers, we're looking at at, at black people. Um, you know, it is as offensive as it as it is a historical, right? Because until the Ptolemaic dynasty. Uh, which is the Cleopatra and the likes uh, who had come from Macedonia. Um, Egyptian leaders had been, had been, um, had been Africans, right? Had been uh, ethnic Africans. And there was no difference, if you will, there was no racial difference between them and the people that were laborers uh, uh, on their behalf. So you see this, but it's implicit, right? Because it doesn't actually say the book itself doesn't actually say that the pharaoh and the leaders were white, but it will drop this image. So as a child, you are seeing this image from the beginning and you grow into it, right? You grow, you internalize it, you internalize it. Uh, let's look at another thing here. Uh, the Atlantic slave trade between 1500 and 1800s brought millions of workers from Africa to the Southern United States to work on agricultural plantations make it sound like it's a, it's, a, it's a study abroad program. It's a, it's a work abroad uh, program where you are brought in to work on, you know. No, these people were kidnapped like animals, right? Packed onto boats, uh, you know, and hopefully we get to talk about some of this stuff as well in, in our next session. Um, you know, so this is that erasure. But when you read this, you know, again, this is a great school book. I think this is out of Texas. Uh, when you read this, it really erases the trauma, right? That black people in the U.S. still uh, haven't recovered from to this day, right? So these are these are the things. But this is from a very Eurocentric approach. You let the Africans tell them, you know, in Zimbabwe, we have a, we have a, we have a saying, a proverb that says, uh, you know, we say, uh, which translates to, the ax may forget, but the tree never forgets. So the ax would tell, us to, would tell a story like this, but you ask the tree what happened, and it will not sound like this, right? So this is why it's important to sort of center things in, in the in the in the in an African uh, in you know in, in African African descendant uh, context, right? So as a result, what is the result of all this? Now with the marginalization, those are just two examples in the erasure. But we can talk forever. Even right now, we're we in the era of of uh, of, uh, of the murder of George Floyd. You see it all the time. Uh, you are seeing this sort of uh, comments about how black people just don't know how to act. In fact, I've seen comments where, uh, where commentators have said like, you know, more of them should be shot or, or, you know, these sort of things. There was a survey recently done in South Africa where for some reason somebody asked uh, white people, do you apologize for apartheid? I didn't even go to the comments. I knew what time it was, but they were overwhelmingly, uh, this is what, I, what I've what i heard. They were overwhelmingly saying like, no, you know, these, these markets can't govern themselves. We, we don't regret anything. You know, if anything, we'll bring it back uh, with, uh, within, a, within a moment's notice. So what does that happen? First of all, there's been intellectual marginalization. Why, what is that? As I've been describing, uh, uh, with a Eurocentric 
uh, worldview masquerading as the normal, every other story that is not that is not Eurocentric is viewed as being deficient. It is being is it is viewed as being deficient. It is not to par. And think about that. Just think about that. That if if things were, I'm Shingi, right? Shingi Mavima. If I define things as as being Shingi centric, all the things that you are not, that are otherwise just different from me, become deficient. I would say if you're not six one, you are not cool. Because I am six one. That is the only reason why that stands. Right? I made that up. I say, like, if you don't dress in black t-shirts, you are not cool. And the only reason that is we take that as law is because I said it. And for the, re- for the next 100, 200, 300 years, that is the dynamic with which the o- world operates because I have some, some, some marginal power over, 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 um, over others, right, by way of oppression. So, so that is that intellectual marginalization. Uh, stories of Africa have not been told. Uh, you know, we're starting, this is why we're doing this. They have not been told, and they have definitely not been told by Africans or we, from an African standpoint. Uh, it also perpetuated inferiority. A lot of uh, a lot of Africans, and that goes into the next one as well. Perpetuated inferiority and ingrained notions of self deficiency, where a lot of Africans, uh, again, this is not to to generalize, but this self-hate and, and self-deficiency has been so internalized, so internalized. Let me give you an example. Recently, uh, Zimbabwe has been, for the past 20 years or so, uh, after a failed, uh, not failed, but it was, uh, it didn't go as well as, as it should have gone, even though it would have happened, a bust uh, land redistribution program um, and other and other external factors as well um, has been going through a very rough economic and socio political period, and I've heard a, a a good number of of of, of Zimbabweans uh, saying you know you know maybe the colonial period was was preferable to this. Um, and of course, the more progressive way of thinking would be, what can we do better, or who among us can, can rise to the to the to the to the mantle of leadership? That, that's just not it, right? Even within our community, within different communities, where um, I had a very dear friend of mine, one of my best friends, asked me the last time I was back home, said, "Yeah, so when you're in the U.S., do you ever come across poor white people?" Uh, you know. Like, yeah, of course, but you know, of course, the, the disparities exist. But I'm just saying, there's this idea of uh, of inferiority where people will clown each other for not in the, from the colonies will clown each other for not being fluent in the colonial language, and nobody ever bats an eyelid when when people mispronounce their own Shona names, for example, their own African names. So these are some of the things that we need to undo. Uh, I've spoken at length about Eurocentric masquerading as universalism. Um, that, you know, the worldview of the two or three uh, or four countries where a lot of the philosophers and, 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 and these things uh, originate from cannot possibly define the rest of the world. How? How does that make sense, right? How does that make sense? So, you know, and that is not to say that worldview is not valid. By no means are we saying that. The Eurocentric worldview is very, very important. But it is not the only narrative, right? It should be. It should exist in 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 in, in, co- in concert with the Afrocentric worldview, with the with uh with the Arabic worldview, with the you know with with his Native American worldviews, right? And some way, and we'll talk a little more about that. So these are the this is these are the results of of this Eurocentric worldview, at least as far as Africans go. Um, but how did we get here? It was a very, this did not happen by accident. It was a very deliberate um, intellectual project. Uh, Carter G. Woodson, uh, who uh, is the father, who is regarded as the father of black history, um, you know, the originator of Black History Month, at least 
what was Negro History Week in the beginning and grew to become Black History Month to this day, Carter G. Woodson writes in his classic book, uh, The Miseducation of the Negro. And he says, uh, the, the parts of the world inhabited by the Caucasian were treated in detail. That's in, in scholarship. Less attention was given to the yellow people, still less to the red, very little to the brown, and practically none to the black race. So he's talking about the way in which uh, uh, academia developed the study of, of, of different people. And you know, practically none was given to the black race, which is why folks will end up saying all that ignorant stuff we spoke about earlier. Now, Steve Biko, one of the anti-apartheid icons uh, who was murdered in the 1970s, says, if you can control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. If you make a man feel that he is inferior, you do not have to compel him to accept an inferior status, for he will seek it himself. He will seek it himself. I'll give you an example of how ingrained this is. In the book, um, Basil, I believe, it's about Basil de Oliveira, who was a South African cricketer uh, who we would characterize, who would categorize as being uh, colored, you know, in, in South, that means mixed in, in, in South African uh, racial uh, demarcations. He would have been, um, being non-white, he would have been uh, a, the apartheid state was against him, but he played cricket so well that they disenfranchised him. And immediately, because he was so good, he finally ended up getting a scholarship. No, not a scholarship. He ended up getting a, a deal uh, in, 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 in England. So he moved to England. And, and this is not to say England is by any means not racist, but it was just not apartheid South Africa. So when he would go out with his teammates in the first few times he went out with his teammates in England, go out to a bar. The teammates would look around and say, like, where's Basil? Find him trying to get in through the back door uh, of the bar, uh, or, you know, through the kitchen door of the, of, the, of the bar. What are you doing? It's like, yeah, where, where I've never been able to get in with the rest of the, of, the, of, of, of uh, you know, we don't use the same door as the white people where I'm from. So I thought that was such a fantastic, you know, manifestation of this idea that you do not have to compare him to accept his inferior status. He found the back door himself in this land he had never been to. That's how much this has been ingrained in him. And again, this is no slight to Basil, who's an icon, icon uh, of, 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 of South African sport, especially of black South African sport. But these are the sort of things that we deal with. So that's how we got here. These are just two uh, prominent thinkers uh, who have spoken about this. Um, and here I use this, you know, in my classes just to show some of the uh, stories that have been erased in large part uh, due to, uh, to a Eurocentric narrative. So for example, over here we are looking at, uh, at the university uh, out in Timbuktu uh, this is going back to uh, the 1200s, 1100s or 1200s, I believe. Um, and again, nobody really talks about these early, early, early places of education in Africa. This is a thousand years ago, way before a lot of uh, uh, the prominent European universities started. We could talk about, uh, I forget the names, but in Morocco and, and Egypt are even more prominent ones. Over here we have, uh, you know, you may know this gentleman, at least depicted here, is the great Mansa Musa, who uh, many um, mathematicians, if you will, uh, estimate as was the richest person to ever live, uh, evaluated at anywhere between 400 and 500 billion uh, dollars. Uh, he was the Musa the second. He was the he was the emperor of of Mali back in the uh, 13th uh, century. And one of the things that he did that I like to talk about is how and this is famously depicted here is he was Muslim. So he went from uh, Mali to Hajj, right? You know, on his Hajj, he went to Mecca, depicted over here. Um, and he was so wealthy, intelligent, and, but he was also very, very generous that he carried with him so much gold 
right, in his caravan as he went to Mecca and gave away so much of it all the way through Egypt, right, all, through, all the way through this, gave away so much gold, so much gold that the price of gold plummeted for the next 10 years or so across, the, across, across Western and Northern Africa. So much gold. You know how much gold you have to give out for the price of gold to plummet for 10 years. 10 years is a long, long time in economics. Such was, was this man. And this year is the, is the, is the, is the, is the great Zimbabwe. Uh, again, I have to shout it out. I'm from Zimbabwe myself. Uh, the great Zimbabwe, which, uh, which, Talk about erasure, right? For a long time, there have been deba- there were debates. Now they've been laid to rest, where a lot of the European settlers could not believe that this was a, a you know, this is from 14th, 15th century, well, 15th, 16th century uh, Zimbabwe. Um, when they got there, they could not believe that the the, the Africans uh, had built this. Um, so. There were a lot of theories about folks from as far out as Indonesia coming out and building it, which is not very dissimilar from the idea of aliens building the pyramids because folks are just not willing to concede that, um, that Africans have the genuity to, to build these uh, structures and, 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 uh, and communities and nuanced civilizations without European co- contact. So, uh, I just use this, again, this is a snapshot, right? We could spend all day on finding instances like this, and I challenge you to do the same now that I'm, I've told you about the Afrocentric idea. Okay, so, so what are the desired outcomes of, of, going, going, uh, of studying things in this way? First of all, representation, right? Remember Carter G. Woodson said that, um, you know, the areas with black people were studied practically, uh, when practically not started. Even some of the people we're talking about, the racist people we're talking about in the beginning, we were talking about how Africa has nothing to present. And we are challenging that narrative that Africa and African descendants have so much uh, to present, right? They have so much. They, such an important part of not just contemporary human times, but of historical, uh, of, the, of the historic, uh, of human history, right? Foundational, foundational uh, to, to human history. And we're trying to, that ties into the next one, we're trying to rectify history where, again, we are moving Africans from being objects of history to being subject of history. We are plugging, um, we, 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 are, we are really pushing for Africa to be, and African descendants to be part of this narrative. We are also pushing for the virtues of Ubuntu, uh, which is a Southern African cont- uh, cont- uh, cont- uh, philosophy, um, Ubuntu, which uh, translates loosely to humanity. Um, but the full term that people use, uh, you, that folks usually say is uh, Ubuntu, Gumudu, Gumuntu, Gabantu, which translates to a person is a person because of other people. So it really speaks to our symbiosis as people. And it's a virtue that we are trying to, uh, that uh, the Afrocentric ideology is very uh, particular about enforcing, especially as as a Eurocentric ideology focuses on individualism. Ubuntu is is sort of like a counter narrative to that. There is a way in which we can do things that is communal uh, and and is for the greater good of, of the community. And Pan-Africanism is something that we'll talk about as well later on in the series, but it's just the idea of uh, people of African descent, of, Afri- of people, African people and people of African descent uh, seeking solidarity, particularly in uh, resisting or remedying the damage that has been done by 500 years of imperialism. Then uh, finally, there's this term we call pluriversalism over universalism. So when we talk about the Afrocentric idea, it scares people not because of its own nature, but because it reminds them of what Eurocentric, uh, this Eurocentric idea is. It is the same reason why black power sometimes intimidates people, the idea of it, because not because of what black power represents, but because of white power, which has existed, represents. What do I mean by that? 
Afrocentric idea does not purport to be uh, an imperial object whereby it becomes the law of the world in the way that Eurocentric, uh, Eurocentrism became, you know, Eurocentrism runs Europe, it runs Africa, it runs Latin America, it runs Asia, you know? No, we just talking about as far as Africans and things to do with Africa go, let's have an Afrocentric approach. So we are trying to have Afrocentric Afrocentrism become the universal idea, but we want it to become one one in the, in where there is no universal idea, but there's a pluriversal a plurality of ideas, which you call pluriversalism. So Africa can call Afri, Afrocentricity can exist in a world where Eurocentric Eurocentricity exists as it concerns things to do with Europe, right? And and these are the uh, centric ideas. And see what, 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 how that can, one, how that will help us contextualize our own communities within the actual story, and two, see if we have nothing to learn from each other that way. See if we have nothing to learn from each other that way. So those are the desired outcomes of, uh, of, 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 uh, of adopting an Afrocentric approach. Um, I believe this is the last slide. Indeed. So going forward in this series, we will talk about different uh, elements of African history. Um, so stay tuned and I will upload more material. And please, I cannot emphasize this, take care of yourself. Um, you know, we're going through a tough time right now and it is very important that we uh, look out for number one and look out for each other in the spirit of Ubuntu. So. Uh, thank you guys for joining me. Uh, if I think of any reading that would help benefit this, I'll put them in the in the in the uh, below the video. So I'll put links to them below the video. So thank you very much for your time, and I will see you soon.